I'd like to begin by suggesting to you that we are now at a pivotal point in the history of Australian superannuation. And why is this relevant to this topic? I'll leave that question for the moment. Why are we at a pivotal point? As we heard in the previous session, the baby boomers are just beginning to retire, and for the next 15 years, we will be retiring. And I'm an iconic baby boomer, and I will retire at some point. Second, we have seen the SG, or we are going to see the SG increase from 9 to 12 per cent. So that means there will be more and more money going into super. Super, 1.4 trillion now, increasing to 3 trillion, 5 trillion. It's big business, it's big for government, it's big for the economy. We must make sure it delivers on what people expect, which I will come back to in a moment. The third reason, or it's important, is that tax concessions for superannuation are under threat. We've already seen the concessional caps halved. We've seen the extra tax on high income owners. There has been talk last weekend and during the week about what else will the government attack? Because the Greens, the left wing group, it was evident at the tax forum, too many tax concessions are going into super. Now I can have that debate. We're not going to do that this afternoon. But in that big debate, people leave out the age pension saving. Why is that important? Because we have to come back to why do we have super? Primarily, we have superannuation to move some of people's income during their working years to income during their retirement years. In other words, you're spreading your lifetime income. Or to put it in economic jargon, when your human capital runs out, you've still got some financial capital to live on. If we don't deliver retirement incomes, then super hasn't delivered, tax concessions will continue to be under threat and we won't have solved the problem. So the topic of post-retirement solutions is a really important one. We need to address it, we need to solve it, because if we solve it, then I think we've got a much better argument to continue the taxation support we receive. In that sense, we really need to be open and ready with each other, with the community and with the government about what is our strengths, what are our weaknesses, and what do we need to do to better deliver what we are talking about and what we're all trying to do, and that is make sure that people can retire with adequate income and in dignity. That's what we're on about, simply put. Earlier this year, the OECD released a two-pager, what I'll broadly call the Ten Commandments, or Ten Points, on the OECD roadmap for the good design of defined contribution pension plans. Now, in terms of DC plans, we are in some senses leading the world. We shifted from DB to DC before the US, before the UK, and other people are following. But it's interesting that the OECD used the term DC pension plans. We don't think of it that way, and I think we need to. Some of the commandments, as I call them from the OECD, we do pretty well on. Commandment number two, encourage people to enrol, to contribute, and contribute for long periods. Well, we do that through compulsion. Number four, promote low-cost retirement saving instruments. That's what my super is supposed to deliver. And in fact, I'd suggest many default funds, if you want to use that term, already deliver. Number six, consider establishing default life cycle investment strategies as a default option to protect people close to retirement against extreme negative incomes. Now, we could have a debate about life cycle as well, but that's another debate. But at least the government recognised that in its latest announcements about my super. But what about numbers seven, eight and nine? And this, I think, is where we don't measure up. Number seven, for the payout phase, encourage annuitisation as a protection against longevity risk. Assess the Australian system, we fail. We don't really encourage annuities. In fact, we don't at all. Number eight, 
promote the supply of annuities and cost-efficient competition in the annuity market. We don't have an annuity market. We fail. Number nine, develop appropriate information and risk hedging instruments to facil facilitate dealing with longevity risk. We don't do it. The Henry Report had a few things to say in that space. The government hasn't picked them up. So we've done really well in the accumulation phase. We are not doing well in the pension phase or the decumulation phase. Account-based pensions are very popular, and I don't rule them out. They're a really important part of what we should be delivering, but they don't solve all the problems. Let's have a look at what the rest of the world is doing. Some of you would be familiar with the report, the Melbourne Mercer Global Pension Index, which will be released next month for its fourth year, expanding to 18 countries. One of the questions we ask in that report is, what proportion of the accumulated benefit is required, that is by legislation, not optional, to be taken as an income stream? And we do not define income streams as annuities. We permit them to be drawdown products, broad definition of income stream. Eight countries we sometimes compare ourselves with. Our requirement in Australia is obviously nil. People can take lump sums and do with it what they like. In Canada, for registered defined benefit or DC plans, 100% into income streams. Denmark, I think, actually comes closest to a reasonable solution. Nothing up to an income, and I've translated the euros into Aussie dollars, up to about $8,000. So if you've got small levels of income, take it all as a lump sum. Once you get an income above about 16,000, then you've got to take half as an annuity. So small amounts, don't worry about it. Larger income streams, half as an annuity. Japan, no requirement. Netherlands and Sweden, take the lot as an income stream. In the UK, they are changing their rules, particularly for higher benefits, but they've started at the old rule is for like 75%. It's too complicated to put all the transitions in, but roughly three quarters as an income stream. And in the US for account-based pensions, no requirement at all. So what it's saying is around the world, there's a whole mix of solutions. Some people are saying it all needs to go into income stream. Other people are saying other countries, none at all. What's desirable from an Australian perspective? I think it's important to say that if we start at the lower income end, we actually have a gold-plated indexed annuity that's very secure. It's called the age pension. So if people have got a small amount of benefit in their super, and many people who, remembering our system is still maturing, but many people still have small benefits, they've got an annuity, it's the age pension. On the other hand, and endorsing some of the work coming out of the World Bank and other places, we need to recognise that retirees need some flexibility. To say you convert everything to an annuity, I think removes that flexibility and the need that people have to access some capital. That might be to buy their last new car, it might be to pay off a debt, although that raises other questions about the purpose of super, it might be all sorts of medical needs that can come upon you in your retirement. So to have it all in an income stream, I think removes that flexibility. So that's not where I would go. But I think to come back to where I started, I think as an industry, we have to start focusing on income streams. That includes account-based pensions, it includes annuities, variable annuities, all sorts of income streams. As, and we need to do that as our system matures. We also need to do it as the ageing population retires and the costs to government start to bite in the health budget, the aged care budget and the pension costs. Because if we don't deliver, the government will say, is super delivering? If it's not, we'll cut back those tax concessions. Therefore, what do we do as an industry? And I'd much prefer us to do something as an industry than to rely on the government and treasury to come up with something. We need to lead the way. And I suggest we need to lead the way in flexible income streams, up to about two thirds of the lump sum for benefits above, let's say, $100,000.
Now, we can argue whether it's 100 or 200,000. Small lump sums, don't worry about it. Above that level, let's put two, two thirds into an income stream. Because if we don't do that, it's probable that within the next 10 years, a government will make that compulsory because of the pressures on government budgets. And I don't think that would be a desirable outcome. I think it's much better that we lead the government, deliver something that meets the needs of members, give some, some access to capital, some flexibility and some involvement. And there's a whole range of products that the next two speakers can talk about and we'll talk about in the panel. But I think the important thing is that we do something and we do it soon rather than leave it because if we leave it, we expose ourselves to risks. Thank you. Thanks, David. Two million Australians will retire in the next 20 years, and most of them are members of funds like those represented in this room. So for this section, I just want to focus on how the decisions that funds are making and may make in the future will affect those members who make it through to retirement. Uh, a lot of discussion goes on at forums like this in the industry generally and government, but ultimately we need to remind ourselves constantly that it's members who have to make sense of this and it's members who will bear the outcomes of any decisions that are made in relation to post-retirement. So let's, throughout this session, think of a member of your fund, uh, one of those two million who are approaching retirement. What are they facing and what might they face in the future? I'll focus on the landscape now and then I want to talk a little bit about why I believe what we've got in place at the moment doesn't actually meet their needs for retirement. But the landscape first. Uh, what do the members face as a member of, the, uh, of a super fund approaching retirement right now? Well, my super, as we know, is what a lot of funds are focusing on at the moment. That is silent on post-retirement. In my view, that is a pity. Um, not because we knew exactly what we would put in there as a post-retirement component were, my, were it to be included in my super, but I think it would have given an impetus to the industry to actually develop and solve this problem more rapidly. Uh, I think now, with it being off the agenda, everyone's running at a million miles an hour to get uh, the pre-retirement section of my, uh, of my super sorted out, and it could be a decade before we revisit that topic but that's the lay of the land. What we also know is that in the lead up to retirement, four out of five members receive the default. Now, I don't believe that will change, but well, the proof will be in the pudding uh, as members approach retirement. Yes, there is a higher level of engagement as members approach and, and, ent and enter retirement, but enough of them will rely on the wisdom of the trustee of the fund that they belong to and or inertia um, will, will, will rule such that they will end up in the default. So when we're talking about post-retirement solutions, we to a large extent are talking about the default. What do we see in defaults in funds at the moment? Well, we do a survey of this, uh, of, of what the large funds are doing every couple of years. And there is some movement at the station, but largely most funds have retained a 70-30 type default, not just up to, but into retirement. We are seeing some, some life cycling, we are seeing, seeing some de-risking going on, but that is in the minority. Uh, and as for the, you know, a lot of talk about traditional deferred and, and the sort of next generation type annuities, but this is a slow burn. I mean, funds are waiting and seeing, funds perhaps aren't convinced that, uh, that those are the solutions that are going to suit their members. We're seeing some interest in term deposits, not necessarily specifically as a post-retirement product, but it does have attraction uh, to a lot of people in that zone, and I think will continue to do so, at least for as long as term deposit rates remain materially above cash rates. But most of all, we're seeing lots of discussion of where to from here. What are other funds doing? What's the next step? So when we look at a typical member who's obviously not necessarily party to or interested in all this discussion, most of them are facing a retirement where they are heading for a 70-30 type defaults and unless they choose to move away from that, 
That's what will guide them through retirement. Is it good enough? I think it's a legitimate question. To make the case for change, we have to convince ourselves that what's there at the moment will not satisfy the members' objectives. And this is where I think we enter this, this, this realm of the difference between macro objectives and individual objectives. And I just want to illustrate that with a couple of examples here. If we take a fund that, as I say, has a typical 70-30 uh, default and a CPI plus 4% target, the fund will uh, manage to that. And over the time frame that funds will typically measure themselves towards that target, say five years or a bit more if you want to be generous, there's typically a chance of say 60 to 70% that that objective will be met. Now that's perfectly reasonable from a macro point of view. I'm not saying that's not legitimate. Five years seems a, a perfectly legitimate time. It gives some focus to those who have to implement that strategy. It gives measurability and all those things that we know objectives need to have. But let's turn it around. What about the member? The member, are we happy to, for our members, if they're building a retirement uh, program that relies on them achieving that CPI plus four, are we happy to put them in a position where we're saying you've got 60 or 70% chance of succeeding, and if you don't, then you, you, you starve or you're in poverty, your retirement program has failed? I'd argue that's what we're doing with this strategy, but is it good enough? Well, that depends on how much longer do we have to wait for, to get greater confidence in achieving that objective. If it's only a few years, it's probably okay. Well, unfortunately, when you run it out, what you find is that to actually get what you might regard as a, as a satisfactory likelihood of that CPI plus four being met, you might have to wait up to 60 years. That's two retirements. I mean, each member's only got one retirement. So I think this is a, a conflict between the way we're set up and the way we measure ourselves and what members need. Let's have another look at another example. It's not just about achieving uh, returns. It's about when you achieve them. Got an example there of uh, a 25 year period where, as you can see there, uh, $100 at the start ended up at, um, having the same return over that 25 year period, albeit on a different path. So, you know, we're long term investors, so surely if, if the returns average out to be the same, then that's good enough for a, for a retiring investor. Unfortunately, it's not the case. This is sequencing risk. And what we see there is that the retiree who retired shortly before the, the uh, poor returns and high inflation of the early, 70, early and mid 70s, uh, runs out of money 15, before they've reached 15 years of retirement, whereas the other one satisfies the full 25 year objective. So it's not good enough just to earn returns. We need to be concerned about when they are achieved we don't get offsets by earning good returns later on. That's the nature of decumulation. So these are real risks. What are we doing about them and can we do something better than what we're doing at the moment? In my view, we can, and it starts with setting the right objectives. Let's have a look there. We can see the first, uh, sorry, the objective there is what we might typically regard as an investment objective for a, for a typical fund and, as I mentioned before, extending into retirement. What would a more member-focused or outcome-focused objective look like? I think to get there, we have to lift the, lift the objectives up a level. We have to focus on outcomes, not on returns, which at the end of the day are an input. So there's an example. Now, there's lots that's undefined in that in that objective, and so these are tricky things that take a lot of thought. But two things I'd point to about that objective. It's based on an outcome that the member can see, touch and feel, and importantly, that objective is an income-based objective, not a lump sum objective. I think we can go further, uh, and, and this is where it comes to refining not just the words, but the whole way we think about what we're trying to do for our members. If you look at that uh, that final objective I've put up there, what, what we've done might look like a subtle change is to say, let's target a band of incomes in retirement, not just a target income. 
In doing that, we have to face the fact that if we're going to try and achieve a floor, we might have to give, some up, give away some upside. So rather than saying I want to achieve at least 45,000 or whatever the right number is, we might have to give up the at least. Now, we're very fond of the at least. We're very fond of the all greater in Australia. But I think that's one of the big philosophical changes that funds are going to have to grapple with, that we can't have our cake and eat it too, maybe. We have to give up the or better or more and actually live with retirement objectives that actually go to a standard of living in retirement. So where does that sort of objective lead you? I think it potentially leads you to trying to achieve the holy grail. And one of the, one of the key points about this whole debate and it's mandatory at any discussion like this is to say there is no holy grail, there is no silver bullet. Like the ice water in the desert, you're searching for something that just doesn't exist. So, and it can be quite distracting to look for that. So the, the, if you go and survey your members and you ask them what they want, they probably want all those things there. But it's a bit more complex than that. Uh, we need to actually find what is important to members and do some prioritisation. And that might be different for different members within your fund. A couple of final points to finish on. It's been mentioned by David. The age pension is really significant. The charts there simply show, without going into the detail, that as you go up the, uh, the, the wealth scale, that the age pension means, testing means, you get, you get less uh, age pension as a component of your overall retirement. But the sweet spot, and for what for many funds, is go, will continue to be their, their heartland, if you like, of, of members. The first chart there, 250,000, that's still higher than what many funds are emerging, many funds members are emerging with at retirement. The age pension actually represents over 70% of their total retirement wealth. So you can't ignore that. And the age pension has the dual effect, not only of lifting their overall retirement wealth, but also giving them, if you like, an investment buffer such that they can actually take more risk, whether they feel that way or not, but they can actually take more risk uh, in the knowledge that the age pension will step in and, and increase their overall retirement position should investment um, outcomes turn against them. So while members might not feel that they can be more risk tolerant because of the age pension, that is a feature that is very important to build into your retirement program. Some closing thoughts. Longevity uh, is a key issue and as we know longevity continues to increase. Every five years when they run the numbers we find that for, for your sweet spot, for your 65 year olds, life expectancy increases by about one year and each time that's measured. That's a significant increase. Will it continue? We don't know for sure, but it's a safer uh, bet to actually build in that it will, again, when you're planning your retirement programs. I believe defaults will endure. Um, a lot of the discussion here often ends in uh, a thought that well, we, if we engage people more and better, that will get them to make better decisions, and I certainly don't disagree with that, but the fact remains that the trust that members have and, and inertia will mean that over 50% of members entering retirement, I believe, will still uh, rely on the default, and so that becomes key. And so, to wrap it up, how do we solve these issues? Well, there's no silver bullet, but knowing your membership is vital. So actually segmenting your membership, what your funds members want and how they would prioritise the various options in, in retirement might be different to others. So actually understanding that in a very deep way is critical to getting better outcomes. Thank you. Great. Well, firstly, I'd like to congratulate whoever promoted this session to get a to keep, a, keep a full room to sit and listen to three actuaries late in the day, or potentially you're all just sitting there feeling you've been horribly misled for the last 40 minutes. But I think just from my perspective, uh, the conversation has, has certainly you know, grown over the last few years to focus on post-retirement. I think that's a testament to, to the seriousness and, and I guess the intensity that funds are taking to look at how we solve uh, these sorts of issues uh, for members going forwards. Um, I guess what I've been asked to do today is just to try and reflect a little bit on some of the emerging solutions in, in various markets. So take a brief look internationally um, and domestically uh, to try and 
gain some insight uh, and try and, uh, I guess, without delving into the problems in a huge amount of detail, start to look at uh, what funds or what approaches funds might take uh, as they start to look at solutions for their members. And I, and I guess both David and Nick have articulated it very well, uh, um, as well as a number of other sessions throughout the conference, that, that ultimately it's about meeting member needs and, and you know, having kind of targets that might be CPI plus or you know, absolute return targets and so on. Really, at the end of the day, what a member's looking at is, can I meet my needs around sustaining an income, maybe uh, a capital amount I'm searching for, maintaining liquidity through retirement so that I can react as my circumstances change, um, and potentially for those lucky enough to have sufficient assets, will I have something to leave behind to, to the estate? Um, and, and the diagram there in particular sort of highlights that, is, is that changes throughout time. We look at you know, people are essentially are trans, transferring from a point where they have a huge amount of human capital, uh, my ability to earn an income in the future, I'm transferring that into, into financial capital or tangible assets. So, you know, ironically, the people that are, are the youngest, they're almost cheering market crashes because market returns don't matter so much to them. It's only when they start to run out of human capital and financial capital dominates that returns matter immensely. Um, and then I, I think, interestingly, you know, this is all in the context of, of, of a market where uh, globally we're now focusing on the risks, risks to maintaining these outcomes. And, and it's not necessarily just market returns, it's, it's inflation, it's behavioural risk. Can we get people to behave in the right way, not take short-term decisions that, to their detriment, um, as well as longevity? And I think there's also a risk from, from our perspective as an institution that we have um, a bias based on our recent experience. And those two charts there, uh, the one on uh, the left-hand side looks at the Australian equity market, um, which understandably has performed very well. And the one to the right of that is, is the Japanese market over exactly the same period. So you know, given our, our, petition, our potential bias, um, would we design solutions differently if our experience had been different in the investment returns that we'd seen uh, as an institution? Um, and so uh, this, sort of, this sort of analysis has been, has been talked about, and uh, Nick had, had something similar. Um, I think the way I describe it is, is once we reach that retirement age, it's, it's all well and good to say we need to de-risk completely, and I think that's part of where, where the debates may be being misled to some respects, because it's simply the fact that returns matter immensely. So negative returns, uh, I guess, you know, set you on a path uh, to depletion, but by the same token, Positive returns mean an awful lot to the sustainability of your assets. So it's not necessarily a case of, 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 of de-risking my portfolio. It's being aware of risk and managing that risk better. Um, if I had to you know, classify, when we talk about in the retail space, for instance, people go and see a financial planner, they go through their 10 questions, it spits out a risk profile, they go, well, you're a balanced investor, by the way, here's a, here's a balanced fund. You know, excellent, there we go. Uh, that balance fund then you know, in the GFC returns and has a negative return. Well, really where those sorts of approaches I, I think misfire is ultimately members are asymmetric. They're asymmetric at retirement where they want to retain the upside but they don't want to be exposed necessarily to the downside in, in investment markets and other things. And we can see that through these examples. We've just looked at uh, a distribution, a thousand scenarios, conservative, uh, conservative asset allocation and balanced asset allocation. The charts on the left show the aggregate position of your assets and, and the charts on the right show the income being sustained over uh, the 10th and 90th and the 50th percentile. Um, and what you can see in the probability chart, we start thinking about your ability to support an income in a probability uh, space, then for people only targeting income to age 75, then obviously being more conservative is going to be better for them. They've got more certainty uh, that I will meet my objectives over a short time horizon, simply because my assets are invested more conservatively. conservatively the, um, the, the breadth of outcomes is, the margin for those outcomes is smaller. Um, but as you start to target longer and longer durations, then I need to have growth to support that. And I think the final chart's really illuminating and, and <clears throat> Thanks to Rosemary for explaining what an IRR was in the, in the previous session. But we looked at IRRs as well over a one year and a five year period. So here you can see on the left hand side, we've charted IRRs against the time at which you run out of money uh, on the horizontal axis. And so there you can see 
the first chart over a one-year basis, it's quite scattered, it's a bit more diverse. I can withstand a negative period and still, in some scenarios, have my assets last a lot longer. But if I start looking at it over a longer time horizon, uh, over a three or a five-year period, and this one's a five-year, then having those poor outcomes over that five-year period at retirement essentially puts me on a path straight to depletion much sooner. So returns begin to matter at retirement more so. And I think it's really interesting, if we start looking, uh, I think, more broadly across the retail market, we can start to point to various examples where people have started to innovate. Uh, overseas, obviously, scale in their pension markets is a lot larger. Um, a lot of them have, have done quite a bit. Uh, we've seen various solutions uh, start to take hold there. And we've started to see similar sorts of solutions be discussed within the Australian market. And I think one of the, one of the issues there, and it's a pretty strong term up front, because uh, you know, I know a lot of people are looking at target date, but target date funds in the US, um, you know, many of them failed. So across the financial crisis, they were marketed as a risk management vehicle, as a vehicle that was designed to try and manage people's exposure to risk as they got closer and closer to retirement. Um, and, uh, and I think the statistics, something like funds that had a target date of, of 2010 had on average a minus 14, 15% return, with some having minus 28% return. Um, so, you know, someone that was going to retire in two or three years had this ma major negative return. So, you know, it was a function of the investment strategy that those products adopted, which was really around decreasing your absolute exposure to equities, didn't really recognise the fact that equities, you know, go through periods where they're much more volatile than other periods. And so, so those sorts of issues started coming to the fore. And we're starting to see now already that the second and third generation of target date funds are big are beginning to be um, sort of developed and, and go into the market there. Um, I think interestingly, if we look at lifetime income products and focus on the Australian market, um, you know, there's been a number of these in the last few years. Um, ING launched a product, um, Macquarie, AXA, um, you know, annuities are out there. But if we focus just on the lifetime income products, then the amount of traction that they've had domestically has been very poor. And, and, and I think that's, you know, founded on probably historically the returns that we've seen and the experience people have had, but also uh, innate human bias, which is people are prepared to make short-term decisions, but they find it very difficult to make decisions that affect them over a 20 or 30 year period, which is essentially what lifetime income products require you to do. Um, and so in, in that sort of context, where most of the focus has really been in the meantime is how do we preserve people, people's capital? How do we start to make sure um, that they're not exposed to so much volatility. And so there we've seen uh, money hemorrhaging out to term deposits and cash. We've seen guaranteed products. Uh, we're having more discussion around overlays, um, tail hedging, those sorts of processes within the investment context. Um, and so I sort of think, you know, the discussion that keeps, keeps, keeps going on is, is obviously we need to think differently. And I guess it's a, it's a matter of degrees in terms of how differently do we need to think. Um, and for budding astronomers in, in the room, uh, these two charts, the one on the left shows you uh, the orbits of the planets that was initially uh, sort of put together hundreds and hundreds of years ago um, when the Earth was the centre of the universe. And then Copernicus, Copernicus came along and, and constructed the second one. And, and really without, you know, with a subtle shift where he simply said, let's put the sun at the centre, we had a profound, a profound difference. And I guess my, my argument is, is if we seek to sort of make, uh, you know, whole scale changes and, and throw, you know, we, we A, run the risk of, of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, and secondly, we make it inherently difficult uh, as an institution to, to garner up all the resources and go through that really lengthy, lengthy change to try and make, make those changes, uh, you know, effectual. Um, and so I think what we're starting to see now in discussions with, with funds domestically and uh, as well as internationally is, is you know, a subtle mindset to think, well, how do we evolve? And I think the, I attended the innovation session a bit earlier today and, and Ben Samuel made a, made a really good point that, that we see these leaps ahead um, you know, regularly and, and, and always sort of need to question. You know, ultimately, everyone thinks their, their new idea is the best idea and it's the terminal point. And ultimately, there's another idea that comes along that, that supersedes it at some point. So I think, you know, with that in mind, evolving as we go, it's going to be a long scale change and it's a long journey that funds need to take. Uh, and the question is, how do you evolve along that path? And, and you know, do we need to set out and solve 
every single problem today, or can we just make incremental improvements to member outcomes um, and start with big ticket items and then begin to focus on more detail as we gain experience and, and scale in this market? Um, and I think the important thing there is by going down that path, it's going to preserve integrity of, of the way funds are currently stru structured, uh, the, the way they're resourced, um, the way they think about uh, their members and, and the solutions they're delivering to them. And ho hopefully it makes it easier uh, and faster to, to bring solutions that are attractive to members. Um, and I just wanted to touch on, on two examples. Uh, and, and look, there are plenty of other, other types of solutions, but really a couple of examples uh, to kind of focus on that point, which is, is obviously target date funds in the US were a big vehicle. They're still huge, a huge kind of um, market in terms of the amount of assets that they have. But I guess the, what we're starting to see now is, is, them, is target date funds changing from having uh, a glide path that might be, say, equity content and starting to have glide paths that are more risk focused. So, so in this example, for instance, uh, this, this fund manager uh, or 401k provider developed a glide path based on volatility over time of the ab absolute fund um, using one of the volatility targeting processes that, that Don Hammer talked about um, yesterday. And then in addition to that, in the 10-year 10, 10 window before and after retirement, they start to actually actively hedge some of the downside risk to try and create that asymmetric risk profile. Um, and then going a step further, you know, for those that are, that are sort of peer sensitive, I guess, in a sense, then, then we're seeing again in the retail space, people start to separate out those risk management items from the fund itself and start to say, well, let's deliver that as, as an additional piece of the puzzle so people can still invest in the same funds they usually have, but then have a risk management vehicle that sits alongside that that's designed to manage volatility or, or manage, you know, the risk of negative returns, those types of things. Um, so, so look, really in, in summary, I think uh, you know, there's a lot to do and I think this, this problem in general is, you know, is a very complex one, but I think if we distill it down into, into really simple you know, member objectives and start to align it with the way our business has developed, then we can begin to make you know, incremental enhancements to what we currently do um, and start providing solutions to members in a much shorter time frame. So thank you.